If you ask a wrestling fan today what's MLW, they're probably going to say Major League Wrestling. However, old heads know that the real MLW is a fantastic company that somehow got to work with everyone from Toots Mott to Jim Crockett Jr. and also gave us the best on-screen authority figure for WWF in all of history. What is this marvelous promotion? Well, it's the subject of this video because this is the history of Maple Leaf Wrestling. A big thank you to my awesome supporters over on Patreon like Middle Kingdom Wrestling and Dakari Garmin. Thank you so much and to get your own Patreon shout out, please sign up over on my Patreon page. Our story begins with a former wrestler by the name of Ivan Mikhailov, better known simply as Mike. Now, there are a lot of exaggerated stories out there about him, such as him being an Olympic champion in 1908, he wasn't, thus making it very hard to tell what's real and what isn't about him. But hey, I guess that's wrestling for you. Anyway, at some point, Mikhailov would team with promoter Paul Bowser. Furthermore, Mike would also pair up with one of the eventual founders of the WWWF and former member of the Goldust Trio, Toots. Then, in 1929, Mike declared that he would be promoting weekly wrestling shows in the Arena Gardens. Now, this was unprecedented, as Toronto was only an occasional stop for major wrestling stars. It wasn't thought to be strong enough an area in order to host weekly shows. However, Mike knew better, and with Toots Mott wrestling the first several shows, the ball began rolling, as the Toronto crowd slowly started to grow from a mere 200 people in attendance to now numbering in the thousands, which earned a right to get Bowser then world champion Gus Soderberg to wrestle there. And with all that, Mike, as a wrestling promoter, became such a big name that he wound up becoming an advertising spokesman. Although these glory days wouldn't last for very long. Before we continue the video, allow me to ask that you please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel as a member of the Know It All Nation and that you give this video a big like and it would also help if your notifications are working too. Anyway, on with the show. The following year in 1930, and a new promoter and a new promotion would enter the scene. And the promotion in question would be the one that we would eventually know as Maple Leaf Wrestling. Originally known for boxing, the promotion was first called the Queensbury Athletic Club when it was created by Jack Cochran. Now, Jack's first show flopped, but that didn't stop him, as he was a really quick study and he learned the industry really fast, being able to overtake that of Mike as top promoter in town in only about a year. And Jack's biggest move, which sealed the deal, was partnering with the freshly constructed Maple Leaf Gardens in 1931, which gave him total control over professional wrestling in Toronto. Because if you control the Maple Leaf Gardens, then you control the entire professional wrestling market in all of Toronto. At least, in the good old days you did. After this, in 1932, everything would change. The Ontario Athletic Commission opted to not renew Mike's license, with Commission Secretary James Fitzgerald telling the Toronto Star that it was done for the good of the sport. And so, Michael Loft decided to book a farewell show on October 26, 1932, before moving to Winnipeg. In order to make this a really special show, Paul Bowser would allow Mike to use his world champion, Henry DeGlain, and his other top star, Bibber McCoy, and allow them to face off in the main event for the championship. However, both of them didn't show. Apparently, there was some sort of miscommunication. Now, some claim that Paul Bowser sabotaged the event on purpose. However, no reason was ever given, and of course, no confirmation of this this has ever happened. After this, Mike would continue to promote out west, but struggled to get by, and he would also reapply for an Ontario license, but to no avail. That is, until he found a loophole. Mike would become a matchmaker for Ontario's Metropolitan Racing Association, a horse racing company. From there, the organization decided that their federal charter allowed them to promote professional wrestling shows without a license. This, as I'm sure you can imagine, didn't go very well at all. Unable to get the talents that they really wanted, they went ahead and put the show on for free, but that did draw 10,000 fans. Nevertheless, they were out of their element and decided that they were better off sticking to horse racing. But you just can't keep a good promoter down. Mike would return to having a license yet again in 1935, and he would make his way back to Toronto, although not in the Maple Leaf Gardens, as that was the home of the other two license holders at the time. At first, things were going rather slowly, but after booking a wrestler named Alibaba, Mike would get a 5,000 seed house. And after that, he would even be able to outdraw Corcoran. Corcoran retaliated by going to the Ontario Athletic Commission and stating that he believed that his receipts were nearly half of what they were the previous year as a result of having three promoters all within the same city. The commission 
didn't care, as they renewed all three licenses the following year in 1936. Going forward, both Mike and Jack would continue to promote in the area, with Jack mostly coming out on top. But that's not to say that Mike didn't still score an occasional victory from time to time. Like with the handful of shows he had featuring the masked Marvel. Then in 1938, the unthinkable happened, as Michaelov bowed out. Even though he already had his license for that year renewed, he instead would offer to return it and ask that he get his $5,000 license fee back. What happened next is anyone's guess, as some say that he allegedly moved to Florida, while others say that he started promoting shows in Rhode Island. Now, where did this leave Cochran? Well, he said that he was going to miss Michaelov as he really liked the competition, and evidently he was so distraught by this, he decided to retire himself the following year in 1939. And the company would be bought out by his two assistants, brothers named John and Frank Tunney. Although, just a few months later, and Frank would inherit the entire thing. And for the majority of the next two decades, Maple Leaf Wrestling was riding off of the star power of one man, Whipper Billy Watson. He was so popular that the Whipper would even run for political office in 1965, although he would come up short. But as far as the world of professional wrestling is concerned, he did quite well, as he won both the National Wrestling Alliance and the National Wrestling Association's world titles, along with numerous other straps. But back to the Maple Leaf Garden. Now obviously, this is Canada, so it's hockey country, but when hockey wasn't at the gardens, wrestling kept people going to the place. And it's not like being second best to hockey in Toronto is anything to scoff at. Following this, in 1978, Frank Tunney would partner up with one, Jim Crockett Jr., and a major executive of his, George Scott, both of whom would buy minority shares in MLW. And while this team-up was a significant get for the NWA, with Toronto now being very important wrestling real estate, things were were all about to take a turn. Five years later in 1983, John's son Jack and Frank's son Eddie would take over, and that's where everything changed. The following year, Jack would sign a deal with Vince McMahon to become the on-screen president of the WWF, as well as the real-life president of Titan Sports Canada, the Canadian office to WWF's parent company. And this deal down the line would eventually lead to Eddie Tunney being kicked out of the promotion. Now naturally, Eddie would take this issue to court, to which Titan Sports would settle, seeing that Eddie was the one who made the initial security deposit for the Sky Dome and had the trademark in Canada for the use of the name WrestleMania in promotion, meaning that WrestleMania 6 could only happen if he allowed it. And so, with that settlement, Vince McMahon got control back, and the event went on as planned, but without Eddie Tunney. Needless to say, Eddie Tunney wasn't the only one who left Maple Leaf Wrestling, as George Scott had already left Jim Crockett Promotions, and Jim Crockett was also out too. Which, obviously enough, also meant that MLW was no longer a part of the National Wrestling Alliance. Which meant that Jack Tunney was the only one left, and that the territory was officially under the control of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Which not only gave Vince another major market, but it gave him an international one as well. And with Toronto being so close, MLW was also capable of broadcasting in upstate New York. Which, when Crockett had a piece of it, gave him a foothold into the New York market. And with this being a crucial time in the race to go national between Vince McMahon and Jim Crockett Jr., Vince solidified that the NWA wouldn't be able to run shows in his home turf, which is why Maple Leaf Wrestling was such a valuable piece of the puzzle for whoever had it. Now, obviously enough, this meant that MLW left the National Wrestling Alliance, and this led to Maple Leaf Wrestling slowly morphing into World Wrestling Federation Television, with the name Maple Leaf Wrestling simply being used in 1986 for local broadcasts of WWF programming before eventually being eliminated altogether and just becoming WWF outright. With the slow transition, more than likely being made in an attempt to avoid the problems of Black Saturday. And so during this time, for Jack Tunney at least, on screen, life was pretty good, as he, till this day, is what an entire generation think an authority figure is supposed to be. Long before the Mr. McMahon character ever showed up, or GNs for both Raw and SmackDown, a lot of us, including myself, feel that this is what an on-air authority figure, if you have to have one, should be doing, only dropping in to give pertinent information. And that's exactly exactly what Jack Tunney did, as he's the one who said that the WWF title cannot be bought when he stripped Andre the Giant of the championship. He also took the belt off of Hogan and put it up for grabs at the 1992 Royal Rumble. 
as well as many other historic moments in WWF. But alas, Tony's time as president wouldn't last forever as things start to wind down in the mid-90s. 1995 would be a turning point for Maple Leaf Wrestling as Vince McMahon decided to close the Toronto office for financial reasons, with this being the beginning of the low time in WWF after the steroid trials, and the Toronto office was apparently deemed as unnecessary. Also in 1995, WWF put on their last show in the Maple Leaf Gardens, which happened on September 17th as the WWF ran an outdoor show outside of the Sky Dome and then began airing events in the Air Canada Center, which opened in 1999, the same year that the Maple Leaf Gardens closed. And speaking of which, the physical Maple Leaf Gardens building was sold off to a major food retailer in Canada under the condition that it not be used as a sports venue or anything that could compete with the Air Canada Center. And as for minor league events, it was thought that they would not generate enough revenue in order to pay for all of the repairs and renovations that were desperately needed. But then in 2009, negotiations with what was then known as Ryerson University began with the federal government agreeing to contribute to the restoration of the old arena, which reopened in 2011 as the Manami Athletic Center and Gardens. As for Jack Tunney, after being removed from both his real life office role for the WWF as well as his on air role, he was forced into retirement in 1995, being rarely acknowledged by the WWF ever since, as he's still somehow not even in the WWE Hall of Fame as of this recording. Now, aside from all the information that was previously given, there are a lot of rumors out there as to what led to Jack Tunney's dismissal. Some claim that he had gambling debts and was siphoning money out of the company in order to pay them off. Other reports claim that despite being Canadian, he allegedly was not a fan of Bret Hart being a world champion, and the WWF simply decided to fully back Bret, even if that meant turning their backs on Tunney. Although it was never confirmed if this was indeed the reason why Tunney was fired or even if he felt that way about Brett to begin with, nor were any of the rumors about his gambling problems confirmed either. Regardless, after all this, Jack Tunney would step away from the wrestling industry entirely. Although he did get to leave the WWF holding onto one piece of his old wrestling life, the exclusive rights to promote in the Maple Leaf Gardens. Because as I said earlier, if you control the Maple Leaf Gardens, you control the entire professional wrestling market in Toronto. At least, in the good old days you did. Well there you go, the history of Maple Leaf Wrestling. What are some of your favorite Maple Leaf moments? Let me know down in the comments and please be sure that you're subscribed to this channel and that you give this video a big like. Thanks so much for watching and as always, Dave knows.